Um, so let's do this. Um, I want to try to do three things tonight. One, I want to mention um, who was here for the sponsor day on Saturday? Okay, a few of us. All right. I want to talk a little bit about something that somebody ans- asked at the end of the time that I had with everybody, and um, a-, a couple of ideas come to mind that would be very appropriate and apropos for us here as parents. Um, then I want to try to solicit some feedback from you, and then I want to try to dive into a couple things that are on my mind tonight. So first, um, there are three things that I want to try to encourage us to do, two especially for all of us, and then one for uh, those of us who have kids in 7th through 12th grade. So somebody asked at the sponsor day, uh, one of the sponsors asked, is there something in particular that you would suggest to us as sponsors that we can do to help our kids, you know, that we're sponsoring? And the answer, um, I actually was intending to say this, but I... I forgot. Shocking. Um, so two things that I would strongly encourage. Um, one would be, how many people here have never read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Okay. So how many people don't have a clue what The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is? Okay. A few. So The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is a, one of the series of books that C.S. Lewis wrote in his um, long series on the Chronicles of Narnia, which is um, a story that's um, easily understood by children. It seems like it's written for children, although it's really not. But children are the lead characters in it, or among the lead characters, I should say. And it's probably, um, as I was thinking about it, going into the talk that we had Saturday, in which we were talking about the charisma that we've done here before, it might be one of the best presentations of uh, a biblical worldview for children that I've ever seen. And so this gentleman asked, who went to school here, I gave him something else as an answer. We were talking upstairs. I saw him and I said, I meant to tell you, read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And he says, I can't believe you said that. He says, when I was in school at Our Lady Good Counsel, my sixth grade teacher, and he read her, mentioned her name, so he's in his 50s, remembers her name and says, she read that to us when we were in sixth grade, and when she started reading it, we looked at her and thought, what in the world are you doing reading a story to us in sixth grade? And she says, within five minutes, like every hand was going up, asking questions and probing. So this is a great time of year to bring a book like that out and to read it with your kids. It's just a tremendous story. It's the it's the second volume, I think, in the series of the Chronicles of Narnia. Maybe it's the first, but The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is what I would read. Um, a second thing that I would encourage, and that's not for sponsors, that's for parents, just to be clear on that. Like, it's one of, the, it's one of those great things to do as moms and dads and to, to read with your kids and just to expose them to a way of thinking about reality. Um, and there's lots of things that you can tease out of it. The figure of Aslan who is a Christ figure, is just a remarkable character. And the, again, the fact that children play such a lead role is really helpful for kids because it helps them understand that God has something for them to do right now. Not when they get older, but right now, that he wants to use them and break into their lives. A second thing to do, uh, so today's the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, as um, many, if not all of us know. Um, how many people here would feel comfortable coming up in front of everybody and explaining everything they know about Our Lady of Guadalupe? One? Two. <laughs> of course you would. <laughs> Three. All right. So here's a great assignment for families. Um, how many people don't really have a clue about Our Lady of Guadalupe? Okay. So this is hands down like one of the greatest and most significant historical events in the history of the world. I mean, hands down. 1529, the Bishop of Mexico writes to the King of Spain. So Mexico at the time, 16th century, early 16th century, it's totally decimated by the Aztec Empire where child sacrifice and a whole set of other ritualistic sacrifices are the norm. Offered, how many people have been to Mexico City and gone to the pyramids? Yeah, so some of us have, right? So those were the pyramids upon which they sacrificed all sorts of people, and including children. And you'll see everywhere in the ruins of the Aztec Empire um, serpents. So the heads of snakes and whatnot. 
So 1529, the bishop writes to the king, he says, if God does not intervene from his holy hand with heaven, this land is surely lost. The missionaries, the Franciscan missionaries had been there for decades. They'd had almost no conversions. Two years later, Our Lady appears to Juan Diego. That's the image, okay? So this image that's up there, which is in our church, um, this is the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. A former first lady who ran for president, who I won't name, just to keep her safe, visited Mexico and asked um, in one of the most astounding moments of cultural insensitivity, that's beautiful, who painted that? And the answer to that would be God. So this is one of the most, if not the most, miraculous images in the world. So the story of Juan Diego, who's uh, an, uh, a Mexican, he's a native, he's an Aztec, is uh, he encounters Mary dressed like um, a simple peasant woman, dressed like this, not quite like this, but dressed in a simple peasant garb. And she shows himself to him on three occasions, comforting him and telling him that she wants a small church to be built in her honor in what is now Mexico City. He's like, right, (laughs) how am I going to do this? So she appears to him three times. Um, She asks him to come a fourth time. He kind of avoids where he's been meeting her on the fourth occasion because his uncle is is, uh, is sick. He's in a hurry to try to get back to him. So he skips the area where he would usually encounter Mary, at least he had in these previous days. And, you know, like you can't hide from saints. So Mary appears to him again, says to him the words that we have in our church, am I not here, I who am your mother? Says to him, your uncle is fine. At the same time, his uncle is having a vision, he becomes healed. Says to Juan Diego again, I want a church to be built in my honor here. Tell the bishop to do it. The bishop had asked for a sign. Uh, the sign that he, w- he wanted something that um, only Mary would know if it was really Mary. So Mary directs Juan Diego to go up to the top of a hill called Tepayac, which you can climb today. And there in the early part of December, he finds um, Castilian roses in December from Spain. He gathers them together with some other flowers, puts them in what's called a tilma, all right, which is a, a coat. That's what that is. That's a coat. That's the coat that he wore, Juan Diego. It's made of cactus fiber. Can't be very comfortable. Um, So he gathers the roses together, puts them in his coat, goes off to the bishop's residence, gets to the bishop, says, here's what Our Lady wants to give you, opens up his coat, the roses fall down. The bishop's not looking at the roses. The bishop's looking at this image, which is left on the inside of his coat. That's the image. There are no brush strokes. There is no outline. There is no paint. Cactus fiber has a a shelf life of something like 40 to 50 years. That's 500 years old. It's had acid thrown on it. Nothing's done anything to it. In the late teens, early 20s, I forget the exact date. You remember the date when the Mexicans put the bomb there? When the the, uh, government... So the government, the Mexican government... Some of us know, some of us don't. We think of Mexico as just this kind of fun place to go travel or perhaps it used to be a fun place to go travel. Um, so the Mexican government was extraordinarily anti-Catholic and anti-Christian, especially in the 20s. They put a bomb in the church right in front of that. There were, I think, 17 sticks of dynamite in the bomb. It's directly in front of the altar. It explodes, blows up the altar. That doesn't get touched. It's right behind the altar. And it seems to be getting brighter. There are so many details about this thing. It's just truly extraordinary. Um, in um, Mary's eye, when they do a... They examine the living daylights out of this thing, as you can imagine. So scientists do everything. They put everything underneath mic- microscopes. Inside her eye, there's a reflection. The reflection is the people who are in the room. So you can see the bishop. You can see the bishop's translator. 
and there's one or two other people, I believe, in the reflection in her eye. A tremendous thing to do with your kids is do an investigation on Our Lady of Guadalupe and learn together about this. 1529, the bishop writes, says, this land's lost. 1531, this happens. Within 10 years, there are tens of millions of conversions. And amongst maybe the, the more important overarching points of our theme tonight, which is Our Lady, is simply the truth that God acts in history. Not just in Nazareth 2,000 years ago, not just in Guadalupe in the 16th century, but now, today, your life, my life. God acts in history. So, can't encourage you enough to do that. Third thing to do for those of us who have kids who are 7th to 12th grade, I would really encourage them to go to Alpha. Um, it has the potential to change their lives. So, can't encourage that enough. All right? Good? Any questions on any of that? Anybody want to correct me on Our Lady of Guadalupe? I got most of it right. Yeah? Thumbs up? All right. Two thumbs up. That's a seal of authenticity. All right, so what I'd love to do, so we want to talk about Our Lady. We talked uh, in the little video I sent out that we want to look at um, Luke 21, 26 to 38. Um, but as I always do uh, or often do when I'm with you, I would love to know if there is anything in a particular way that's on your mind that you want to ask about Mary. Mary's often a hang-up issue for a lot of us. It was for me for a long time. I didn't start praying the rosary regularly until after I got to Our Lady of Good Counsel. And then within... Three months, I went to Lourdes, Fatima, and Guadalupe. So, questions? Okay, so he, uh, the question has to do with the fact that Gabriel says to Our Lady, um, he will give to him uh, the throne of his father David and of his kingdom there will be no end. Exactly, so, and that's a specific thing. So at God's beginning, so how is God seen in David's throne? Okay, so the question has to do with, the it's really the identity of this person and um, how that fits into God's plan for salvation history, maybe. Okay, we can look at that. How about other things that people... I know there's people in here who have hang-ups with Mary. Or questions. It doesn't have to be hang-ups. Just questions. Like, why do we do whatever? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that's a... Uh, did everybody hear that? Yeah. So it just I think it's a helpful thing to say, Cheryl. I mean, just the, the sense of, as I'm listening to you, one of the beauties of the faith um, is that there's just always more, right? And so you and I are members of the same family. We're members of the family of God, which means there are a boatload of brothers and sisters that we don't know yet. And God's continually introducing new people into our lives. And he knows when to do that. You know, so for me, it's 12 years after I'm ordained a priest, I finally really begin to develop a friendship with Mary. <laughs> um, 
So, yeah, I think, thanks for sharing that. I mean, we're supposed to, we want to be patient with ourselves as we grow in faith, you know? And um, somebody once described um, how little they felt like they knew about the faith. This person was a professor and said, I used to be overwhelmed by what I don't know. And then he said, and then one day he realized it was like walking into a garden and there were all these, you know, array of flowers. And he says, you know what, today I'm just going to enjoy that group of flowers and just how they look and how they smell. And then the next day or the next week, maybe I'll enjoy these over here. I don't have to know everything right now. I can just grow. Huh? And another thing that comes to mind as you're talking is just if you don't have a particular friendship with Mary and you're a, a woman, um, if you're in this room, you're a mom. And one of the most, um, one of the easiest ways to get to know Mary is to ask her, mother to mother, woman to woman, um, help me to know your son. She knows every experience you have. And so it's a, she's a great teacher with regards to that. You, you just have an access to her in a way that, that we as men don't. Yeah, Jeff. Greatest human person that's ever lived. Ah, okay. So, that's, so the question is, how is it that Mary is the greatest human person and Jesus is not? Jesus is not a human person. Jesus is a human being in the sense that he has a human nature. So Jesus, um, per, so philosophically, which actually is pretty important, right? Person answers the question, who is that? Nature answers the question, what is that? So you look at me and you go, who is that? And you go, well, I think that's Father John. You, you look at me and you go, what is that? And you go, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's someone deformed. You go, um, that's a man. Okay. When you look at Jesus and you go, who is that? The answer to who is that is that's the eternal son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the one through whom the universe was made. So when he speaks, like hit the, the I, you know, like quote unquote I, letter I, I am. Whenever Jesus speaks, the one who's speaking is the eternal Son of God. His nature, what he is, is both God and man. He is God by nature. He takes human nature in the incarnation. So we celebrate, we celebrate Christmas as a, as a birthday. Lots of us, right? We, some of us have birthday cakes for Jesus. Christmas is not a birthday. Christmas is a wedding. That's what Christmas is. It's not like God begins to exist, right? Or Jesus begins to exist. The second person of the Trinity begins to exist. What begins to exist is the wedding, the union of the divine and the human nature in the person of Jesus growing in Mary's womb. Does that make sense? All right? But so the wedding, the marriage, the only real marriage, quite honestly, is the marriage that exists between divinity and humanity in the person of Jesus. And that's what every one of your marriages is supposed to point to. The love that God has for humanity, which becomes flesh in the person of Jesus. Okay, does that help? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe like what Cheryl was saying, you know, so um, we get to know, uh, I think as we just grow in faith and develop relationships with various saints, like you can't have a relationship with every saint. You just don't have enough time, right? Like I have a small number of friends. And then you get to know, just like you get to know other friends, like so I'm in the middle of, Starting this nonprofit, like there's a series of people I'm calling, like they're good for this. I need your help. Great image for the saints, right? Like I need a house. I'm calling Saint Joseph because he's a great intercessor because he moved a lot <laughs> and he built them. 
So, or my eyes are struggling. I'm having vision problems. I'm talking to St. Lucy, whose feast is tomorrow. So just like we ask certain friends here for certain things because we know they're really competent in them, so we get to know the saints that way. Um, that said, Joseph often gets shortchanged. Um, the way John Paul would talk about him is he's the guardian of the Redeemer. He's, it, it, even more so, he's the guardian of the, God the Father's two most cherished loves, which is his son and Mary, the mother of his son. So Joseph must be one extraordinary man. And brothers, what kind of dream would you have to have to be able to wake up and look at your wife who's just told you that she's pregnant, but it's okay, it's God, (laughs) for you to believe it. For real. Because Joseph had that dream. I've had a lot of dreams. I can't fathom that dream. But this is an extraordinary man who is willing to put faith in what is in out of this world, quite literally, announcement that his wife has made to him. So he's a great intercessor for lots of things, including good dreams. Anybody hear that? Okay. So it's a great question. It's something that's plagued me for years until a couple years ago. Um, So the question has to do with the the Gospel of Luke begins with two annunciations. The annunciation of Gabriel to Zechariah about the birth of John the Baptist, that his wife Elizabeth, uh, who's been barren for many years, is going to conceive and have a child. Not miraculously in the sense of it's not from God, Uh, But she's past the age of bearing children, so it is miraculously that way. So that's Annunciation 1. That's Gabriel goes to Zechariah, who's a priest who Luke describes as a righteous man. So this this is a believing man, right? So he's there. His wife's past the age of childbearing, so we don't know how old they are, 60s perhaps. Zechariah asks kind of the duh question, how's this going to happen? Gabriel says, I am Gabriel. Boom, struck mute. Zachariah doesn't talk till Elizabeth gives birth. Okay. Next story. Same angel. Goes to Mary. Another annunciation. You're going to have a child. Mary asks, how? She asks, why does she ask how? Let, let's look at this passage, okay? And then we'll pull this apart because this is, this is an just a great text to look at and to try to learn from. So it's Luke 21, uh, or 1, starting in verse 26. And if you don't have a Bible, Sandy's got some here. She's got a bucket of Bibles. In the sixth month, sixth month of what? Elizabeth's pregnancy, right. So six months after what has happened in the first annunciation, right? So Elizabeth's six months pregnant now. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Anybody been there? Has anybody been in Nazareth? So I have several times. So another great thing to do with kids, find YouTube videos and whatnot and show them these places. Because until you see the places, it it seems like you're reading a fairy tale. You go to the places, and everything changes. So we have the ruins of Nazareth. Nazareth is still a city right now. It's a somewhat violent city. 
at least at times. Um, but the ancient city of Nazareth where Mary lived is all excavated, or most of it's excavated. It's small. There's maybe 100 people who live in it. If we don't have Mary's house for sure, it's, if it's not here, it's there. Okay? And in Nazareth, there's a, a basilica that's built called the Church of the Annunciation. The lower level of the basilica has one of my favorite places in the whole world. So in the lower, lower level, there's this um, plaque on the ground. And it says in Latin, um, verbum caro factum est hic. And you all know what that means. So, um, which means the word was made flesh here. Like this is where it happened. We're not talking about long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. These are not myths. These are not fairy tales. This stuff is so anchored in history. The first reading or the gospel that we had last week at Mass, naming all those people. Huh? Pontius Pilate was this, Tiberius. We know all those dates. We know the dates of every single one of those people. That's how we know that that date is either the year 28 or 29 AD. These aren't just characters from a comic book. So we need just to know, unfortunately, many Americans are not so great in history in general, let alone world history. So find videos. Look at Nazareth. Look at Bethlehem. Look at these places. Because they're there, and you can walk them. And when you walk them, it's all different. That's why they call the Holy Land the fifth gospel. If you ever get a chance to go, go. You live in Detroit, for crying out loud. How bad can it be? So in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was, you're supposed to hear this is all dramatically building. Luke could have just said in the sixth month, Gabriel went to Mary. He doesn't. Why? Because humanity has been waiting. All of humanity has been waiting ever since Genesis chapter 3 and the fall of Adam and Eve, which got us stuck in slavery and set the human race off the tracks, held under the power of sin, under the power of death, and under the power of Satan. And that's how every member of our race was born, under his dominion, and there was no escape. But God promised, even at the moment of the rebellion, he promised he would put enmity Hatred between the woman and the serpent. And between her offspring and his. And he, God says, the serpent would strike at his heel, which means it's an annoying wound. And she, or he, it could be either way, would bruise his head or crush his head, which is to say destroy him. You step on a snake's head, you kill it. You get bit in the heel, It's painful. And so ever since that moment, the worst day in human history, our race has been waiting for that woman. This is that woman. And so Luke starts, it's kind of like this, you know, slow building drum roll. And then finally gets to, and the virgin's name was Mary. The greatest human person who ever lived, without which you and I have no hope. You would not be free from the power of death if it were not for Mary, so far as we know. And neither would I. That's why you can't and I can't honor her enough. Not worship. I want to worship God. But honor. And he came to her and said, Hail, what? Yeah, not Mary. Catch that? That's huge. He addresses her by a word in Greek, which is never used for anybody else. It's not found anywhere else in the whole Bible. The word in Greek is kakeratomene, not that we need to know that, but it's important. And he addresses her as if that is her name. He doesn't call her Mary. He calls her this. And this is who she is. It's her identity. Kakeratomene means um, filled with God's grace or filled with God's power. 
No one else in the Bible, no other human person is this. And the, the, the tense of the word, uh, it's a perfect tense, so it's an action which happened in the past, which carries on indefinitely into the future. So God has done something to fill her with grace, and it just keeps going. This is the Immaculate Conception. That's the scriptural, that's the scriptural text to look at. The Lord is with you. But she, just like Zechariah, was greatly troubled. So far it's identical, almost. And considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. Which means what? God saves, right? Names are everything. Kakaratomene right? means she who is filled with grace. Jesus means God saves. It's, what he, it's not only who he is, it's what he does. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him, there's that passage, the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said, how? Why does Mary say that? Mary's married. Okay, she's betrothed to Joseph, doesn't live with him yet. But it's not an engagement. So the, the Middle Eastern culture at the time, betrothal was kind of a, uh, or marriage was a two-stage process. The moment they're betrothed, they're married. They just don't live in the same house yet. But she is his wife. And yet she says, how? To which Gabriel should have said, well, what do you mean, how? I mean, you guys don't live together yet, but you're going to live together. When you live together, you're husband and wife, you're going to have conjugal relations, you're going to have a child. Like, what do you mean, how? Why does Mary say how? Because Mary was never intending to have children. And she wasn't intending to be sexually active. So the oldest tradition, we don't know this, so this isn't capital T tradition. People attack this all the time whenever I say it, but it's, they think I'm attacking Joseph. I'm not. So the church formally defines that Mary is perpetually virgin. She has no children, except for Jesus. We don't know who these other brothers and sisters are in the gospel, which are clearly named as brothers and sisters. So there's two ways of understanding them. Either they're just family members of Jesus, because brothers and sisters is a term which is used very widely in that culture. Um, could be cousins or other relations. But the earliest tradition about who these other people are is that they're Joseph's children from an earlier marriage and that his wife has died. So one of the traditions about Joseph, and it's, it, it's just it's out there, it's not something that the church formally teaches, it's just one of the older traditions, is that Joseph marries, has children, his wife dies, he marries Mary to care for her. And so it's one of the reasons why oftentimes in art you'll see a significant difference in age between Joseph and Mary. So Joseph marries her to care for her because there is no role at all for anybody in the ancient world who's a woman who doesn't marry. Worth comes from motherhood and, fa and family. That's why a widow is so utterly destitute, especially if she has no children. You can't just get a job, <laughs> right? Family's everything. And if you have no family, you are alone. So she says, how? Because she has no intention of living that way with Joseph. The angel does not give an answer that Mary goes, oh, I get it. The angel says something to which you can picture Mary going, what? <laughs> so how can this be since I have no husband? She has a husband. She just has, hasn't been with him and has no intention of being with him. The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The verb that's used there, the word that's used there is the word that's used for how God would appear over the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament or over the temple in the Old Testament, or the Holy of Holies. It's a very particular word. And an amazing action is going to happen to you. To which you've got to picture this 13, 14-year-old girl going, huh? 
And what's that going to do? Right? Behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. And Mary said, and here's why we honor her, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her, or we would put it much more colloquially, you can do whatever you want. I am entirely yours. That's the Christian's life. That's what you and I are supposed to be shooting for, to be able to say that each and every morning when we wake up. Lord, I am entirely yours. Whatever you want to do, I'm available. And she can say that because she trusts him, because she knows him. Now, what's the difference between her and Zechariah? Here's what I think the answer is. Flip to Zechariah, or excuse me, Luke uh, 1, verse 13. So until this verse, Zechariah encounters Gabriel, just like Mary does. He's afraid, just like Mary is. The angel says, don't be afraid, just like he says to Mary. And then he adds this line, for your prayer has been heard. Now, for me, that's the line that changes everything. So here's, here's, this, is, this is where this passage suddenly becomes very applicable to you and me. I don't know about you, but there, um, there certainly have been times in my life, and there still can be times in my life now, when I can pray for, especially if it's people, sometimes it's things, you know, like things to happen. And when I first began to pray for them, very fervent, right? Like, like Lord, I trust you. I know you love me. I know you love them. I know you're going to break into their life. Whatever. So, boom, I put them on the altar. I just lay them there. Yeah. You pray that way for a month, six months, a year, three years. Five years go by, and pretty soon it's just a name that comes out of your mouth. And I pray for Bob. Just like I've prayed for Bob every day for the last five years, and you ain't done nothing. But I'm going to pray for Bob again. Anybody relate to stuff like that? Man, I can pray that way. So here's Zechariah. This is how we're supposed to imagine Zechariah, right? So to be childless in the ancient culture is to be thought accursed by God. So here's a couple. They're righteous, according to the scriptures. They get married. They have all these plans, just like couples here. We got all these plans for children, for family, for whatever. And they're good plans, right? Like, surely God's in this. I'm asking for something that I know God would want. We want a child. Like, we're living in a culture that doesn't, that just disposes of children. We want a child. Everybody in here knows couples who struggle with infertility. Some of us have struggled with infertility. So here, we're praying for a child. Surely God's going to grant this. Nothing. And then years go by, and decades go by. And now this once really fervent, faith-filled prayer just rolls out of Zachariah's mouth with no faith at all. It's just rote. And again, I relate to that in spades. And suddenly here comes Gabriel, and he says, Zachariah, your prayer has been heard. And Zechariah says, how? And he's struck mute because he's begun to pray rotely. It's as if Gabriel looks at him and says, then why did you ever bother to pray? Does that make sense? That's what's happening here. Now, similarly, so they're praying, they have a good intention. They want a child, doesn't come for a long time. Mary, Mary's dedicated her life to God. She's going to consecrate her virginity to God. She's got a good plan. I'm going to be just totally available for you to live in this way, even though it's going to cause me some 
ostracism because people are going to think something's wrong with me, but I'm consecrating my whole mind and body to you. Sounds like a great plan. You know, noble idea. Surely God's going to be pleased with that. And suddenly Gabriel comes and says, nice plan, no. God's got a different plan. Actually, he doesn't just want you to have a child. He wants you to have his child. Talk about a 180. (laughs) Which, again, is a really awesome lesson for us, painful lesson for us. Sometimes you and I, we get to things, we discern things, we think there's no way this is not God's will. Like, my intentions are pure. What I'm asking for is good. And yet... What God has in store sometimes is something entirely different. Like when I was in my early 20s, I felt like the Lord said, John, I'm going to give you a lot of children. And I was almost engaged to a woman, about to get married. Well, that didn't quite turn out the way I thought it was going to turn out, but man, he's given me a lot of children. (laughs) Okay? So we have all the, we have not just intentions and desires, sometimes we hear the Lord say things to us in the way that we know God talks to us, but we don't quite understand how that's going to happen yet. And we just want to come to understand that as we grow in faith. You with me so far? Yeah? All right? Does this make sense? Okay. So, among the things that are in this with regards to Mary's import, right? Here's how I would think about it. Ours is a culture... um, all you got to do is walk out of, you know, the checkout at CVS, turn on your computer and look at who pops up, read the headlines, whether it's celebrities or athletes or politicians or whatever. They get and they clamor for your attention. We lavish in our culture honor and praise upon people who, quite honestly, do not deserve it. Or if they've done something, it's something that's oftentimes, I'm thinking especially of sports, and I love sports, right? But so great, so you did something tremendous. Well, that, good for you. Like, you should feel really good about yourself, but it doesn't really impact my life. <laughs> it might give me a, uh, an emotional high right now, like, hooray, we won. <laughs> but it doesn't change my life. If it does, something's wrong with my life. Because <laughs> that was a game. This woman changes your life. Why? Because if she doesn't say yes to this question from Gabriel or this proposal from Gabriel, you and I are stuck. So it's, uh, it's often, there's a, a contrast that's often made between Eve and Mary. So at the beginning of creation, you've got a woman huh? conceived without sin, who's a virgin, betrothed to a man, visited by an angel, fallen angel. She's disobedient. The result of her disobedience is death for the entire human race. That's often referred to as Mary tying humanity into a knot. At the recreation of history, you see another woman conceived without sin who's a virgin, who's betrothed to a man, who's visited by an angel, who's obedient, the result of which is life. She undoes the knot that Mary or that Eve had tied. And because she does, you and I have been rescued. All she has to do is say yes The moment she says yes, and she could have said no. She could have said no because Eve did. If she says no, you are in utter despair whether you know it or not. If she says no, you're doomed to hell whether you know it or not. If she says no, you're under the power of sin and you can't get out whether you know it or not. You and I owe everything to this woman. That's why the, the, the bumper sticker that you often see in Ann Arbor, which is so dead wrong, is so dead wrong. Obedient women rarely make history. 
Without her obedience, there is no history. Or there is no hope for history. The key is who we're obedient to. She's obedient to God, which means she hears him. That's all obedience means, to hear from. I know who's talking to me. I know this God. I know he intervenes. I know he acts. I know he cares. I know he saves. I know he rescues. I know he creates. I know he's not a genie. He doesn't just give me whatever I want when I rub the lamp. But I know he's good. And so I will place myself at his disposal. And she does. And because she does, she begins by the power of the Holy Spirit to conceive this child in her womb the same way that you did. And you and I have a redeemer. And that's why we honor her. So in this culture which honors all these people and adores all these people and gives adulation to all these people, how is it that we don't honor her? Or that we suddenly think, ah, that's a bit much. People go to Canton or Cooperstown or Springfield, Massachusetts, and they stand in line to walk into a Hall of Fame for football or for basketball or for baseball. They drool over these people from the past. They go to Hollywood. They go to New York. They watch plays. They drool over actors and actresses. For what? I remember um, watching, this was years ago now, it was a Sunday morning, so it was in the college football season. I forget what the game was. I think when T- Tim Tebow was playing still in college at Florida. But there was some pretty heroic play at the end of a game, and everybody was just talking about it. It was, it was all over the news, all night long, all morning, whatever. And as I'm praying the next morning, just saturated with all this as I'm reading different things, I felt like the Lord just said, where is my glory Where is the honor that is due me? How do you not know what I have done for you? How is it that this person is getting all this attention and the churches which are built to get close to me are empty this morning? Or the people who are there, most especially the men who are there, are mute, too ashamed to open their mouths to pray or to sing to me who has created them and saved them. Where is my glory? And it was a really challenging rebuke and word that I experienced personally. Because that's just, that's justice, right? Justice is to give to somebody what they're due. And God's due all my praise and all my thanks, and all my life. And our ladies worth my honor and my honoring because of what it is that she's done for me. All right? Does this make sense to us? Yeah? So one of the things, again, just to, as we keep inching our way closer to Christmas, for me personally, one of the things I'm praying for, not just for me, but for us as a parish family, right, is that we would understand. I, my fear is we think we know what Christmas is about. We do not know what Christmas is about. I do not think we get this. I do not think we understand why he came. And he wants us to know more fully why he came, and especially as parents, so we can teach our children why he came. And why it is that you and I, in the midst of a world which is a mess and has been a mess ever since the fall, has reasons for hope. And the answer to that is because God has intervened. And he continues to intervene. He's done so definitively in the person of his son. We're still waiting for the fulfillment of all that he's accomplished for us. But I have hope and you have hope because God's done something about death and he's done something about sin and he's done something about darkness and he's done something about hell. And because of that, I can live in peace. Okay? All right. Does that provoke more questions?
necessarily impactful because I just sort of think like the next generation of kids are sort of saying two or three, I am your, your servant, but when, when she sort of nudges Jesus on his journey towards the cross, I think she's sort of knows where he's going. And that's that was great just thinking about the importance of So great question. So John two and the wedding of Cain is very important. It's not as important as the Annunciation. The reason for that is so Mary's not passive at the Annunciation. She's receptive. Big difference, right? And, and you and I, so God is, God is the one who always is taking the initiative in our lives, in all of creation. And you and I are invited to respond to that, not to be passive. It's not like Mary just goes, whatever. That isn't Mary's response. Mary's response is, I give myself to you entirely. Here I am. Yeah, so we want to be careful with that because that's how we kind of imagine this, right? So um, Jesus is not like the lazy Messiah who needs a, you know, a good Middle Eastern mom to go, hey, get out there. What are you doing? Um, she might have been tempted to think that way, but it's not like Jesus needed to be slapped and go, oh, yeah, right, Savior of the world. I better get going here. Um, that ain't what's happening there. So the wedding feast of Cana, what's significant is... Um, Mary doesn't change Jesus' mind. So look, look at the text. It's John chapter 2, starting in verse 1. So on the third day, so John's retelling creation. So the, the gospel of John is just telling, on the first day this happened, the second day this happened, the third day this happened. These are all the, John's retelling Genesis in essence. There was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding. So it's not like Jesus was there with his buddies. Mary crashes. She's not like the wedding crasher, like, hey, son, you better do something. She's the one who's actually invited. Jesus is also there, also invited. When the wine failed, so to to grasp this, you've got to know a couple of things. One is, so wine is um, a symbol of what? Joy, absolutely. So Sirach, best passage in all the Bible. What is life without wine? <laughs> Personal favorite. Um, it's in the Bible, right? So, so, so and the, the, the loss of wine is one of the prophecies in the Old Testament about how um, things will be apart from God. And the giving of wine So like uh, Isaiah 25, on that mountain, God will provide for his people a banquet of rich, juicy meats and choice wines. So that's a vision of, it's an image, okay, of what it will be like when the Lord puts everything back together. So the loss of wine is a symbol of um, despair, and the giving of wine is a symbol of the joy that comes from God breaking in. So they run out of wine. So it's, it's more than just like, wow, how embarrassing. They got no wine. That's, that's actually the literal truth, but behind that is the meaning of wine and its purpose. Jesus, so when the wine failed, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, a woman, which sounds like the worst thing you could possibly say to your mom, right? But this is not an insult. This is a direct reference back to Genesis 3 and that passage we were alluding to earlier that there will be enmity between the woman and the serpent. Jesus is not disparaging his mother. He's identifying his mother as that woman. Okay, that's what he's doing there. He's saying, this is her. She's the one. And then this gets translated really badly into English. What have you to do with me? Or what is your concern of mine? And what Jesus is really asking, this is, this is what he's saying to her. Um, we would translate it as something like the Lord looking at his mother saying, you realize, don't you, that if I do this, the whole relationship's going to change. That's what he says to her. From here on in, 
if I do this now. Yeah, so you, and, and as a parent, you know it's super scary. There's another level of Mary that you and I can't relate to, which is Mary is one sinless, which I don't have a clue how to fathom that, right? So Mary never sees a situation with selfish eyes. You and I always do. Everybody in here does. However altruistic you and I might be, you and I always look through selfish eyes. Always. Even though, even you moms who are just giving to no end. We always, that's the stain of original sin that marks us. Huh? Mary doesn't have that. Mary's never self-driven. Ever. In any way. So that's one thing that you and I can't relate to. The second thing is her child is God and she knows it. Because she's a woman and she knows, I haven't been with a man. And this child came out of me. And I don't know how that could happen. So, uh, you all might think this is a cute little story, but I know I woke up one day and realized I was pregnant and I'm a virgin. I don't know how that could happen. So, it's more than just like, I'm going to lose my son. It's much greater than that. So, is she pressuring him or is she bringing something to his attention? And the church would say she's bringing something to his attention. And just like it happens, uh, we do this oftentimes with the Lord in prayer too. We bring something to him and sometimes he'll say, uh, you know, I can do that, John, but everything's going to be different if I do that. You ready for that? So the question's put back to me. And so Mary, again, isn't being passive here. She's being receptive, and she's able to say, yeah, and then she can look at the servers and go, whatever this guy tells you to do, do it. So she's acknowledging, yes, I am willing to let the relationship change. And she does it as an expression of her love for the human race, which she knows he's come to save. Does that help at all? Does that make sense? So there's lots of things we can relate to Mary. There's a lot of things that we can't relate to Mary. Okay. Um, maybe I can end just with this, huh? and then um, unless we got other questions, this is one of the. Some of us were at mass Friday night, but I, for me, I can't think about this enough. Anybody in here struggle with trust? I, I would argue there isn't something that we struggle more with than trust. And I don't think anybody can teach you and me how to trust like Mary can. So back to that passage you were alluding to in the, that we we were talking about in Luke where it says, you know, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. He will have the throne of his father David, meaning he's a descendant of David. He's going to occupy, he's the one who's going to fulfill the prophecy that God had made to David long ago that I will put an heir on your throne whose reign will never cease. That's who Jesus is. He's both David's Lord and his descendant at the same time. Okay? So Mary here is, this is what my child's going to be. My child is going to be, he's the fulfillment of all these prophecies. She's a devout Jew. She knows the scriptures. If anybody is entitled to think, you know what? I'm just going to, I just got visited by an archangel for crying out loud. I'm going to get comfy. My child is the redeemer of the world. Let the gala begin. Come see me. Bring your treats. Thank me. I mean, if anybody is entitled to think, my life is going to go smooth. I've just said yes and undone the knot of Eve. (laughs) Look at me. Right? That's not how she's... She is, obviously, but if anybody's entitled to think that way, it's Mary, isn't it? She's the greatest, she's the highest honor of our race. That was the psalm today for the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Mary is. If I'm her, I'm not her, but if I'm her, I'm thinking, I think I can expect God to watch out for me, take care of me, 
surely my prayers are going to be pure and they're going to get answered and life's going to be good. I mean, look at, the, look at what Gabriel just said. His kingdom will have no end. I am on easy street. So Mary lives, I said, in Nazareth, right? Nazareth is 50 to 100 people. Mary and Joseph are married, but they don't live together. Mary goes off to visit Elizabeth, comes back. She comes back from after being away. And she comes back visibly pregnant. Some of us in here can relate to that. Imagine the talk. That's all they do is talk. That's, that's the life together of a community that doesn't have the internet. You actually spend time with people and they talk and they gossip and they slander. And this woman who makes possible their salvation becomes the butt of their jokes, the object of their scorn, and the object of their slander and gossip. Right? Her husband, she has to hope somehow, how in the world, because he's, he's about to divorce me. Why? Because I'm pregnant, and we haven't been together, and he knows it, and I know it. So I got to trust some. Fathom, figure this one, sisters. I got to trust somehow God's going to find a way to convince this man that this vision I had of the angel was legit and this child's God's. And somehow that happens. Joseph believes it and doesn't divorce her. Then as she moves along in her pregnancy, a census is called, and they got to move. They don't just hop in the Winnebago, right? They get on a burrow. <laughs> Go from Nazareth to Bethlehem. It's not around the corner. They get there. No place to go. I'm the mother of God, for crying out loud. Where's my room? <laughs> right? Surely there's got to be a room here. God can't want this. No room. Where'd she go? Into some sort of farm area. Here's the mother of God giving birth to the Savior of the world. And who's there? A cow. A donkey. An ox. Where's the kings? Where's everybody coming? Why aren't they here to line up? Where is everybody? No one's there. Some shepherds come. They're the lowest of the low. They were considered to be, by the Jewish people, beyond salvation shepherds. Then along come some pagans. It's nice. They bring some odd gifts. They bring gifts for anointing for burial. Thank you so much. Okay, a little gold too, but wow. Talk about a downer, <laughs> Right? Oh, and before they leave, they say, we just want to let you know we stopped by to see the king for directions, and he's nuts, and he's trying to kill him. And so, sure enough, out come the soldiers, and they start to slaughter every child. So you've got to leave. You've got to run, right? No time to, you don't even know where you're going to go. They go to Egypt. They don't know anybody in Egypt. They have no friends or family in Egypt, so far as we know. Boom, move to another country, living with people who are totally unlike them, trying to figure out how in the world did we get here? Like, we were just with Gabriel. Like, kingdom, throne, no end, son of the most high. I'm in Egypt, for crying out loud. Egypt's the place of slavery for the Jewish people. This is the worst place to go. Boom, madman dies, they come back. Move to Nazareth. Then you get... How I think too, you know, so Jesus comes home and, and he's there. And that's about it. He's just there, doing nothing. Years go by, like 30 years go by. Suddenly he goes out, goes out, gathers some people around him, 
praise, adulation, miracles, huge crowds, murmuring starts happening, things start getting said about him, people start plotting to kill him. One of his best friends, somebody that you know is Mary, turns him in, betrays him. She sees him arrested, stripped naked, flogged almost to death, humiliated, spit on, crowned with thorns, nailed to a cross, the most gruesome execution in the world. And here's Mary standing right here under her son's naked body on a cross. And everything inside his body is coming out onto her. And I don't know how Mary isn't remembering the Annunciation. That's what you do when loved ones are dying, right? You just start having flashbacks. All these people that I remember. All these scenes, happier moments when things were better. And she remembers Nazareth and that day when this archangel came and made this promise and this prophecy and all these great things and she's looking at her son naked and dying. And then he dies and they put him in her arms. Anybody held loved ones after they've died? pretty final. When you seal a tomb or you smooth out the dirt on the grave of your son or daughter or husband or wife or mom or dad or brother or sister and you walk away, it's pretty final. And she goes to bed on the night we call Good Friday. She doesn't know it's Good Friday. And she wakes up wondering, how in the heck am I going to go on? How, how did it end like this? How did it possibly end like this? And then she goes to bed the next night and wakes up the next day and tries to figure, how am I going to live a new normal? We try to do that when we lose loved ones. Our loved ones weren't the eternal son of God. And then suddenly on that morning that we call Easter, though the Bible doesn't talk about it, it has to be the case that the first person Jesus shows himself to is Mary. It's got to be. Who else would he want to show himself to but his mother? the one who made possible the salvation of our race, by her yes. And he just, I just imagine he just stands there and she looks at him and they just laugh and cry and shake their heads. And, and then he goes out and shows himself to everybody else. And all along the way, what's the point? All along the way, Mary has to learn to trust. Therefore, nobody can teach me how to trust like she can. So God is always faithful. Always faithful. The promise is the only way for him to show me that he's faithful is to put me in a situation where I don't think he can come through. And so I just ask her continually, teach me to know him and to know that I can rely on him, that he keeps his word, that his promises are all true, even when they take time. Help me to know that. If you want a gift for Christmas, that would be a great gift for Christmas. Mary, teach me how to trust. Teach me to know him, your son, more than I do right now so that I can say what you said. Here I am. I'm yours. Have at it. Use me. However you want to use me, use me.
That's discipleship. That's what, please God, you're trying to raise your children to be able to say. And if you do, then your kids will talk about you the way I and my siblings talk about my parents. Every time we get together, we just talk about them. And we talk about them in such a way as we look at each other and say, how did we win the lotto? Not because of stuff we had. Because of who they were and what they taught us and how they taught us to live. May your children speak about you that way. And the decisions that you're making and doing right now and the actions that you're doing right now have everything to do with how that will play out in the future. Everybody here wants to have that happen. The question is just like, what have I got to do to live that way in such a way so that it will happen? And it'll happen, trust me. I can't shut up about my parents. May your kids not shut up about you. And may Mary pray for you that that'll happen. Okay? Great. Sandy? Absolutely. Yeah. Just by way of introduction, my name is Ryan Agenberger. I'm a seminarian for the Archdiocese of Detroit, actually a parishioner here at Our Lady of Good Counsel. And in fact, I was that guy behind the camera from 2012 to 2015. So for me to come back here wearing one of these, speaking in this room, is very, very surreal for me. Um, so just by way, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry in advance, I'm not as eloquent as the priests. haven't had my homiletics classes uh, yet, but I have had a little background in Exodus and uh, the Pentateuch. So anyway, it's good to be back here. It's an honor to be here with you tonight, and um, I, hope we can, I hope I can do justice for you, at least in some way, and where I feel, I uh, just hope the Holy Spirit will um, touch you and, and uh, speak to you in ways that I cannot. Uh, but the prayer is up, which is good. Let's, um, let's go ahead and say the prayer. The prayer we're just going to do for tonight is uh, a recited prayer. You probably know it. It's the Magnificat from, from Luke. It's Our Lady's words. Uh, and it's really small, so if I'm sorry, if you can't see it, we will, those who can see it, um, we will pray for you and with you. So, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lady of Good Counsel, pray for us. Please pray for us. Okay, so this is my friend Hugh. Well, he's not really my friend. He just lives at the seminary. Uh, he's a seminarian. He just moved in. He has no idea I'm using this picture. Uh, it's on Facebook. That's him in the orange. Um, and I'm using this picture. He'll probably never know because he'll probably never watch this talk. Um, he's a great guy, though, but he's, uh, there are, in the seminary, there's like five or six Matthews, and so his nickname is Hugh. And Hugh, if you're paying attention, would correspond to holiness, election, and worship. So uh, again, these are the topics we're going to talk about tonight. Because we don't have a lot of time, I wanted to kind of give you these three themes as, as, a, as a way to approach Exodus when you're reading it on your own. Um, instead of kind of diving in, you know, like, per, like into uh, each story within Exodus in a really close-up view, we are going to look at one of those stories. But this is kind of, you know, general themes to keep in mind as you're reading Exodus, will help, which will help you understand 
what's kind of going on in Exodus, kind of like a 30,000 foot view of the land below. And I thought that would be the best approach uh, with you tonight. Um, and then again, as you're, as you're going through Exodus with your children or um, just on your own in personal study, you'll have some of these themes in mind um, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So we'll quickly talk about holiness and election and then we'll talk a break and then we'll take a break and then we'll, we'll um, wrap up with the theme of worship. So we have holiness. In holiness, we, have, uh, we can talk about holiness in a lot of ways. We talk about personal holiness, my own like, response to the Lord, right? Um, my own conversion, uh, my daily conversion. The church is holy, right? Just objectively, uh, because she is the bride of Christ, which he is the one who makes her holy. We have holy people, like the saints, right? The Holy Father, we have holy places, holy um, sites, holy things like tabernacles, vestments, stuff like this. Good. <clears throat> when we're reading the Pentateuch, particularly the first five books of the Bible, it's important to remember to think somewhat like an ancient Jew or whoever would have written Exodus and to have some of these things in mind, right? There's just some things a part of the culture of the ancient mind that's important. This is a definition of holiness, which I think is about God particularly, um, from Father Hardin's Modern Catholic Dictionary, which is a really great uh, resource on the internet, um, which you can look up like a lot of cool definitions, like what's grace, what's actual grace, particular grace. He spent a lot of time doing this. Anyway, he talks about holiness. He said, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew, kadosh, meant being separated from the secular or profane or dedication to God's service. And then he goes on, dot, dot, dot. The holiness of God identified his separation from all evil. So as we're reading Exodus from a 30,000 point view, again, we're looking at the story as uh, the people of Israel are, are, are being chosen and they're being delivered. In their mind, again, is the idea of God as just absolutely beyond majestic, untouchable, holy, totally separate from us. We've kind of lost this, I think, in our American culture in a lot of ways. Um, so again, as, as we're looking at Exodus, this is kind of what they're talking about. Um, man, I can't even read that. Getting older. God's name is holy. I just wanted to pull some uh, examples of holiness and everything that's related to God is holy in the, in the Old Testament, and this will have ramifications. God's name is holy. So in Exodus 20, he says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Not only is God holy, his name is holy. Everything about God is holy. And because he is holy, again, he cannot be approached. Exodus 33, Moses, the Lord said, I want to pass by you, Moses, right? But if you remember, the Lord could not turn his face towards Moses. It was the Lord's back as he was passing by, right? And the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man cannot see me and live. Another aspect about God and his holiness. This is a chart which I first saw in my metaphysics class uh, last year. And honest to God, I never thought I would ever have like use this, ever. Metaphysics was awful. <coughs> The big circle, this is just a small demonstration to understand the idea of God's otherness and his transcendence. A lot of times when we say the Lord's holiness or the Lord's glory, right, we imagine like God is like really big, right? God's not really big. He's not a size. The big circle here, my metaphysics professor told me, represents all of the created universe. So that's like the edge of the universe, and beyond. The little blue thing there is Earth. The point being, if we left Earth and traveled millions and billions of light years away, we would never run into God because he's not there. He's not like in the created universe in his essence. He intervenes and he steps into the created universe, primarily through the incarnation in Jesus. He has done it upstairs right now in the tabernacle. He stepped into time, right? But God, that line there represents like 
invisibility or visibility, right? He's, he's nowhere, and yet he's everywhere, but he's also nowhere. The, Jew, the Jewish mind of the ancient Jewish culture, totally aware of this. Unreachable, untouchable, you cannot get to God. There's no way. Yet when he does manifest himself in Exodus, this is after the crossing of the Red Sea, they come to Mount Sinai, Moses has to go up onto the mountain. Because of God's otherness and his purity and his sinlessness, and his, oops, lack of cooperation with evil, the people can't come through. They can't, they can't actually go up to meet God on their own because he is so holy, and he's teaching them this. This is why only Moses and Aaron can come up. They're the chosen ones. They prefigure Christ in a way, okay? But only Moses can come up onto the mountain. The people have to remain down low. Again, and this, is just, this just manifests God's holiness and our unholiness and our, our sinfulness. Not in a condemning way, though. Again, other manifesting ways. So Moses, here he is. He, uh, God is stepping into the created order here as a burning bush. Okay? The, the church fathers will say this is actually Christ hidden, the second person of the Trinity, speaking with Moses because Christ is the word of God. That's just a conjecture. I don't know that that's doctrine. What you'll notice, because of God's holiness, he asks Moses to take off his shoes. Well, what difference does wearing shoes do? We'll find out in worship. This is one way that God gives to Moses as a gift that Moses can then reverence God's holiness. Okay. We'll see this over and over. God seems to want to be separate from the unclean and from the sinners, Again, not as a way to condemn, but just to teach as a gift. He's different. This, is, uh, this would be a picture of the tabernacle, which after they start journeying in the desert for 40 years, every time they camp, they have to set up, the priests anyway, have to set up the tabernacle as a place for God to dwell. Notice it's separate. Only certain people can go in. The Levites right, can go in, and only Moses and Aaron really can go into the, um, the, the tent. Somebody actually reconstructed something like what it might have looked like, okay, the, the, tab, the tent. This obviously will prefigure eventually the Jewish temple. Has anyone been to Jerusalem? Yes? Yep. So this is in Jerusalem. This, is, this isn't in Jerusalem. Anymore. Right next to, this is all kind of gone now. Right next to it now is the Dome of the Rock. If you've seen pictures of that in Jerusalem, it's built on the same site. This is the temple, and this is, I'm just showing here again that this thing was massive. I think, I think they said it was like, what, two-fifths of the city of Jerusalem at the time when it was built. This is uh, eventually as the Israelites come into the Holy Land, they take over Jerusalem, they build this temple. That big part there, again, that's the Holy of Holies. That's where God resides over the Ark of the Covenant. And only one day a year can one man go in there to make atonement for sins because God is holy. Again, so he's just showing his distance here as a gift. Jews still do this today. If you have a Jewish friend and they're somewhat, you know, devout, they may, on Facebook, I've seen this on Facebook, maybe you have too, when they talk about God, they'll leave out his, the middle initial because his name is so holy, you wouldn't want to pronounce it or even put it there. Okay. Jews still do other things to reverence God's holiness these days. A lot of them keep, cope, keep kosher. They keep the Sabbath. Because of God's holiness, then, we have this idea of election. Again, the second point, then, would to be remember as we're going through um, Exodus, the unique call, considering how holy God is, rather, for the Jew to realize that God, the untouchable, the, the perfect, the holy, of all the nations on the earth, chose Israel to be his own possession. It really makes it special when you have God in that, that one place, right? When you understand his, his glory and his magnitude. And so for a Jew, again, to, to realize that um, God has chosen us to save us from slavery of all the nations, to call us his firstborn nation, his firstborn son. What an honor, right? The Holy One has chosen us first. And this is the teaching of the Catholic Church. I should have made this bigger. If I ever come back, I'll make it bigger. Sorry. I'll read this. This is from uh, the Catechism. So this is Catechism, paragraph 1961, not year 1961. 
If you have a catechism, you look up uh, Numbers by their paragraph at their page. It says, God, our creator and redeemer, chose Israel for himself to be his people and revealed his law to them, thus preparing for the coming of Christ. Why did he do that? Remember back in Genesis 15, God made a covenant with Abram, changed his name to Abraham, promised Abraham that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky, which was a crazy promise at the time because Abraham was 99. He and his wife wouldn't have a kid again for 25 more years. So you can imagine God not speaking to him for those 25 years thinking, I wonder if God's really going to come through on this. You know, I'm 111 now. <laughs> you know, I'm 120. Are you going to make good on your promise? But he promised Abraham that he would be with Abraham's descendants forever. We see this again, this promise. Then the Lord said, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, because eventually those people made their way down to Egypt and became slaves to Pharaoh. I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Exodus 4.22, And you shall say to Pharaoh, Moses, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. Okay. Another goal I had tonight was to make sure I connected it a little bit for you to Christ so you, as you're having those conversations again. Uh, with your kid, you can make sure to say, like, this is great for them, and this is what it means for them as we're reading the scripture, or we're reading Exodus. Use these four questions that I give you. My favorite one of those questions is, what does this reveal about God? What's, what's God doing? What's God saying to the people? We're really good about asking, like, what, should I, what should I do now, right? But first, like, ask, and ask your child out loud, what does this story tell, tell us about God? Okay? I think that's important. So my second goal tonight, though, is once you do that with your child um, and with yourself, ask, what does this now mean? How, how do we understand this now in the light of Christ? Right? There might be a couple Jewish converts here. I don't know. But probably a lot of us are Gentiles. Right? We're folks who were not born Jewish. And so how is it that we can claim relationship with God if we're not Jewish? Right? So it's important. The reason we can is because of Christ. So I wanted to just, just highlight that. At least one. Paul talks a lot about this in Romans 9 through 11, but really all throughout the, the New Testament. Paul says this. He goes, They are Israelites, and to them belong the sonship, the glory, the covenants, the, give, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and of their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, God, who is over all. Be blessed forever. Amen. So again, even, even Paul, in preaching the gospel, is highlighting the unique call of the Jewish people. God, the second person of the Trinity, became Jewish. Right? They're very special. They don't even realize how special they are then, because if they don't believe in Jesus, that would be the greatest honor, it would seem like. But they do know how special they are, and the, we recognize that as Catholics. Again, God, our creator and redeemer, chose Israel for himself thus preparing for the coming of Christ. When you're talking to your child, or again, for your, own, for your own reflection, for prayer, it's now because of Christ in which we are brought into Israel. We're brought into the people of the covenant. Okay? Paul talks about this in Ephesians. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles... It's probably most of us. The mystery was made known to me by revelation. Jesus appeared to him and told him this, apparently, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is how the Gentiles, it's you and me, are fellow heirs members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This means now that by adoption, what God did for the people 
in Exodus and throughout all of the Old Testament by virtue of adoption, by virtue of the fact that we are now adopted into that family, he has done for us. It's part of our heritage as well. One as Christians, but as Gentiles. Okay. This got Paul in a lot of trouble, obviously. This is the very first paragraph of the catechism. I'm sorry, again, we're not going to scripture. We'll go to scripture a little bit in the second part. There's just so much to cover in the scripture. Um, and I think this really highlights some of the, the 30,000 view here. This would be a good practice to do with prayer, and I'll demonstrate in one second. The very first paragraph of the catechism, which probably lays out you know, the rest of the catechism, what it wants to talk about. It's probably one of the most beautiful paragraphs. It says, God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, again, totally other and holy and happy without us, in a plan of sheer goodness, for no other reason, right? He freely created man to make man share in his own blessed life. For this reason, at every time and in every place, God draws close to man. He calls man to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. So far we've talked about Israel being chosen. We've talked about Christians being chosen. The Gentiles now in Christ being chosen. I need a volunteer. One volunteer. Yes, what's your name? Scott. Scott. Scott, I want you to hear this. Scott. God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created Scott. To make Scott share in his own blessed life. For this reason, at every time and in every place, God, draw, God draws close to you. He calls Scott to seek him, to know him, and to love him with all Scott's strength. This would be a great thing to take to the Eucharistic uh, Adoration Holy Hour, just the first paragraph, or the chapel upstairs, the day chapel. Take the very first paragraph of the catechism and insert your name in there. And really pray with that. Say, Lord, what does this mean? Convict me. Teach me what this means. How much you love me. How impossible this is. How glorious this is. That the Holy One, the one that is totally unapproached, like unapproachable, has chosen me, has created me in a plan of sheer goodness. As you do that, that might help you talk to your own children again about if you experience that sense of being chosen, okay, you can help share that experience then with your child and with anyone, really. Right? Okay, I'm out of time, which is good because that was my last slide. So first set of questions on your table, if you would. Just choose one. Just look them over. You can go around the circle. I think you have 10 minutes before you have a stretch break at 7.30. Um, so let's go around this table. Just choose one. You don't all have to answer the same one. You can answer different ones if you want. So, Okay? Worship. If I'm your Facebook friend, beware. So in Exodus 32, does anyone know what that is offhand? This is, anyone? This is the uh, golden calf account. So Moses goes up. We're not going to read it again for time's sake. I'll just tell you again. Moses goes up on the mountain, gets um, the Ten Commandments on the first time. God reveals to Moses some preliminary things about worship, about what's he, what they're supposed to be doing. Moses comes down, and what had happened in the meantime, Aaron asks for everyone's gold because the people demanded that they have something to worship. So Aaron, Moses' brother who was left behind, gathers all the gold, they make a golden calf. Why a golden calf? Any ideas? Right. Where did they just come from? Egypt. I forget his name, but the golden calf in Egyptian religion, it's not a golden calf, but just a calf in general, is an important god. So it's not like they just kind of came up with this idea, I want to worship something, let's make a cow, right? Like, no, like, this comes from their past. They had been slaves in Egypt for 430 years, right? That's like double the amount America has been a country, almost, right? So it's been a long time. They're familiar with, with um, 
pagan religions, the Egyptian religion particularly, and they have this desire to worship God, but God hasn't really, you know, like this is not blaming God, but he really hadn't like given them any way of how to worship quite yet at this point. He's just delivered them from the Red Sea. They rejoiced. They sang that song in Exodus 15, which we sing at the Easter Vigil. Let us sing to the Lord, for he has covered himself in glory. It's an awesome, the whole chapter is just a hymn of praise. It's a good thing to take to prayer sometime also, Exodus 15. I can't find my paper, so I'm going to have to go on this. So there's the, there's the golden calf. There's something in the human heart. We all worship something. I would suggest in America right now, most people worship themselves. Look at my Facebook profile. Look in the mirror, right? I will decide how I spend my time. Sunday Mass, eh, right? Not this week. Contraception, no. They don't know what they're talking about, right? I'm my God. I decide, okay? We build these golden calves. And again, it's not... Um, this is just this comes from their experience and again we're an American culture so we have gods that as we have gods that um, we grew up with we in a sense can't help it in a sense okay <clears throat> Moses comes down gets really mad throws the tablets right they break they melt the golden calf and he makes them drink the ashes The people get sick. He goes back up the mountain. God gives a new set of tablets, finishes his instructions on worship, particularly, do you remember that picture of the tent I showed you? The preliminary thing of the the tabernacle, the Jewish temple. He gives Moses, for like chapters and chapters, how to build this thing. It's very particular. And if you read it, he says, because I am holy, because I am holy, because I am holy. And it's It's particular. The reason for this is because I'm holy. It's not just arbitrarily, I want, you know, like he gets, like God gets really specific with like what color, right? What kind of materials to use over this thing? Who can go where at what time and stuff like this. But for a Jew, again, we talk about this is the 30,000 foot view. For us, this looks like you just delivered people from slavery and you just put them in a new slavery, right? This worship looks harder than it did in Egypt. In Egypt, you just had to make bricks. Here, we got to build this tabernacle, and then you're giving us kosher laws, and you're giving us all these things. But for a Jew, that's not what what they're thinking. A Jew thinks this. God freely gives the right way to worship God. Again, God's so holy, how in the heck am I supposed to get there? God, in his goodness, provides a way. He says, tell you what, if you live this way, I will honor this as worship. You will be set apart like I'm set apart. You will live differently than other people live. Be holy as I am holy, and I consecrate this way as holy, right? And you can be with me and live in this, this covenant relationship. God freely gives the right way to worship. And this is, this is why the law for a Jew is like incredible news. This is great. They love the law. He gives the law to protect his people from becoming slaves again. I'll tell you what, worship this way so that you don't fall into worshiping golden calves again, right? So it's for protection. He provides his people with concrete ways to stay in covenant relationship with God. This is a gift, right? And thirdly, he says he gives the right way to worship God, to share in his own, God's own experience of being in communion, of being in friendship and right relationship with God. The Jews didn't know this, but we know God is three. He's a communion of love of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This has got to be an incredible experience for God if God has experiences. I don't know, right? But this has got to be an incredible thing. We know through Christ that this is God has given us Christ so that we can share in his own divine nature, in his own life, in his own love. God is giving his people in Israel and now us a way to share in God's own experience, as weird as it sounds, of himself. These were just a whole bunch of verses, which I can't read this far away, which we're not going to read. That's from Exodus uh, 34, just an example of God giving ex- uh, ways to worship. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. You shall observe the feast of weeks, the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Three times in the year your males appear before the Lord God 
of Israel, which is what they do in Jerusalem. That's why Jesus goes to Jerusalem often in his life, because he's got to keep this, this command. Again, this is a gift. Okay, so you can read that on. Anyone know where this? Probably not, because there was one person who had been to Holy Land. Does anyone remember this, where this is? No? That's okay. I got to go to the Holy Land with the seminary this June, past June. This is a picture I took from the top of the Mount of Beatitudes, looking down. This is a banana field, which is now, it's like some farmer owns this and he grows bananas. This is the Mount of Beatitudes now. Looking down on the Sea of Galilee, which would have ended right here. That's where Genesaret is, where the pigs kind of fell uh, off the, the cliff, right? This is where uh, John, like Peter would have called James and John. This is Capernaum down in here, Magdala, and then it kind of goes on over there. In Israel, this is the Mount of Beatitudes. It's like a hill. The Sea of Galilee is a big lake, right? You can see across it. My point is, when we're talking about now that we're in Christ, I just want to connect Exodus again to us. What does this mean? Jesus goes up on the mount, and he gives the new law, which is in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. starts with the Beatitudes, right? Matthew, who wrote Matthew, is making a connection for anyone who is Jewish-minded to say, hey, then Jesus went up on a mountain, he sat down and began to teach. Well, this is, for a Jew, this is, this is Moses, this is law, this is gift. This is a way, this is a gift from God to protect me, to provide for me, and to somehow it's calling me into a deeper relationship with him. That's one verse, right, in Matthew. And if you don't know that, if you're not Jewish-minded thinking, for Gentile like us, we don't hear that. It's important, though. So again, Jesus gives the new law, gives the Beatitudes. Where is my paper? Sorry about that. I have a couple of verses from Matthew. He gives the Beatitudes, and he, he keeps going. And my point is here. Thank you. Oh, you have, Scott, you're the best. Thank you. God thinks so, too. Jesus gives the law. He raises the bar. I want to say, a lot of times we go to confession. Go to confession minimally once a year, right? The church says. We go to confession. A lot of times we take the Ten Commandments, which is a good start as an as a, as a examination of conscience. Have I honored my father and mother? Right? Have I stolen? Have I committed adultery? Have I kept the Sabbath day? Which for us is Sunday, right? But Jesus gives a new law. He, in fact, raises the bar for Christians. Right? You've heard it said you shall not kill, but I say whoever is angry is liable to judgment. You've heard it said you shall not commit adultery, but I say if you even think about adultery with a woman in your heart, you are liable. Okay? Again, for us Americans, we're like, oh, slave, oh, this gets hard, this is too hard. But remember where the law is coming from. The heart of God here is to protect us from being slaves, to provide concrete ways to stay in a covenant relationship with God. So Jesus gives us a new law to stay in covenant relationship with him and to share in his own experience of living in communion and friendship with God. And so when Jesus climbs the Mount of Beat the hill, the Mount of Beatitudes with the banana farm, right, looks at his disciples and raises the bar for his disciples. We shouldn't think, oh, I just don't know if I can do it. No. Why is he doing this? To keep, keep this in mind, okay? For a Jew, then, again, the fact that they're given the law is to walk, the greatest reason, really, is to walk in covenant relationship with God. It's for really no other end. A lot of times before we sign up for a new program, Right, or I'm gonna do like a new like uh, I'm gonna start a new habit, right? And it's gonna because I do this, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna get A, B, and C, right? And get more money, I get better, healthy, or something like this. For a Jew, worship of God, the opportunity to be in a relationship with the one who is totally other, after realizing that of all nations He's chosen me to be in relationship with Him, is the blessing. What an honor, okay? So they don't do it just to get something 
out of it. I think we sometimes we lose, I do, I, I lose sight of this, right? I forget to be in a relationship with God is an honor. It's actually the goal. I don't, I'm not in relationship with God so that um, I have a great life or I feel fulfilled at the end of my life or whatever. Those things come with it for sure. But the end itself, it seems from a Jewish mind, and again, if you're reading Exodus, they're being delivered out for the purpose that they can now walk in covenant relationship with the Holy One. Okay. So as such, now in Christ, because we can be in living relationship, we, I just pulled out some scriptures here, we are living sacrifices, walking with God again, because now that we're in Christ, if those of us who believe in Christ, who are baptized, if you're not baptized, I, as a Christian, I strongly encourage you to seek out baptism. Okay, Maybe someone here is not baptized. I don't know. We are in Christ. We have this unique, special relationship now with the Heavenly Father that other people don't have. Again, what an honor and a privilege, and we should really respect that. So what does the New Testament tell us about this? We are living sacrifices. Living sacrifices at all times. Again, in the Old Covenant, the Jews would live separate from people to mark that it's because of God's holiness they've been set apart. They are now holy. We're brought into that in Jesus. We are living sacrifices in the midst of the world. We are lights in the world. Well, presumably it's because the world's dark, right? We are a holy people, not just any people. We are a holy people. We are a royal priesthood. Priests in the Old Testament had special, at the, the Levites really, and the Aaron, the Aaronic priests, the sons of Aaron, they had special privileges to get close to God when other people couldn't. Okay? All Christians, Paul says, I'm sorry, Peter says, is a, a royal priests. We all get close to God. We all have access now to the Holy One in ways that before they, people didn't. We are a holy nation. Christians are a nation, like Israel was a nation and is a nation. We are a nation now. Our, our, we don't have borders. We're in, we're in all nations, right? But we as a people are a nation, a chosen nation. Lumen Gentium is one of the documents of the Second Vatican Council. Particu- I wanted to throw this in there, particularly to the, to the laity. I'm still a laity. I'm still a layman. So this accounts for me too. We put into right order, as God's chosen people, as royal priests, we put into right order that which has fallen out of order by sin. Primarily, you folks do that by raising your children and in your work, right? I do that by trying to do my homework as much as possible, right? Put into right order, bad things. And above all, we do all things in love. We're led by love. We do things by love, for love, and in love, always. As such, as a Christian, our response to God is total. There's no having it. You're not kind of circumcised as a Jew, right? That doesn't count. You're all in. As Christians, as a holy nation, as chosen, we're all in. How do we not, how do we know then in the midst of this work that we're not building golden calves, right? We have guides, we have scripture, we have the church. Again, we talked about this. <clears throat> Finally, I want to hammer home again about being in relationship with the Lord. This is the goal. This is Exodus 40 is the last chapter in Exodus. Again, which would wrap up like the goal. I'll just read this very quickly. I won't read all of it, I promise. So the Lord said to Moses, on the first day of the month you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, which again, he just spent the last 10 chapters basically telling him, how to build it as a gift for the people. You shall put in the Ark of the Testimony. That's the Ark of the Covenant. You shall screen the Ark with the veil, again, to show its holiness, because God's going to sit there. You shall bring in the table and set up its arrangements in order. You shall bring in the lampstand, the menorah, which represents the, um, the burning bush. And set up its lamps. You shall put on the golden altar for incense before the Ark of the Testimony, Blah, blah, blah. Thus did Moses according to all that the Lord commanded him, so he did. So Moses did it. He built it. 
We, and we saw a picture of it, right? And then this is the end. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Paul tells us that like, we are the living church, right? That God dwells within us now. We don't have to go um, to Jerusalem to worship. We don't have to go to the tent of meeting, right? The Lord abides with us. And he has, we're living sacrifices. We worship God in the way that we live, okay? With the end goal of being in relationship with God. And finally, again, just to hammer home, Peter talks about this again. Father John loves this verse, and I think rightly so. It comes up all the time. His divine power, God's divine power, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, I would say holiness, right? Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Again, in the catechism, it says, by a plan of sheer goodness only. By which God has granted to us his precious and very great promises that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion. And again, the goal, the cloud, Exodus 40, right? And become partakers of the divine nature, to be in communion with God, to share that relationship with God that he has within himself, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the goal. And we can do this. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do this, okay? 